that it is 837. We'll call the meeting to order. Good morning. Today is October 6, 2020. Um, Larry Schmidt, Director of Personal and Professional Standards. This is the Response to Resistance Board. Uh, this incident occurred on October 31st, 2018, involving Officer R. DeConti, ID number 63452. If I can have the rest of the board introduce themselves. Sure. Jackson Short, Division Chief for Professional Standards. Sarah Mike Silcock, Committee Officer, of Community Engagement. Uh, Felipe Alicia, the SWAT Commander. Lolita Smith, Assistant Chief, Communications and Property and Evidence. Uh, and Lieutenant Silcox will be the floor lead for today's hearing. We also have uh, personnel from OGC, the Academy, and Gun Range, if you'd all introduce yourselves, please. Gabby Young, Office of General Counsel. Tony Batchers, Training Sergeant. Buck Killingham, Fire and Rent. And so All right, can I have uh, Detective Radigan and Officer DeConte to the front? Just want to confirm before we get started, before the meeting started, you signed all your appropriate paperwork and rights forms. Yes. And then Officer DeConte, you waived the right to a single interrogator. Yes, sir. All right. And then you both were sworn in, which means you understand you have to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. All right. All right. Before we get started, I'm going to read the confidential notes. Based on the current state of law, these proceedings are considered confidential and are not subject to disclosure until they become public record. Therefore, anyone participating in these proceedings is prohibited from willfully disclosing any information obtained during this process, including the nature of the questions asked, any information revealed, or documents furnished in connection with these proceedings until they become public record. Do you understand? All right, the purpose of the RTR Review Board. The Response to Resistance Review Board conducts administrative reviews of incidents involving certain uses of force by members of the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. These reviews are conducted to ensure adherence to agency policy and training. Consistent with state and federal law, the Sheriff's Office affords substantial deference for the instantaneous judgment and decision making that must be used by law enforcement officers in certain situations. However, this deference does not permit any member to depart from agency policy, training, or professional standards of reasonableness. Since the ability to use force is such an extraordinary license given to law enforcement officers, the public looks to the Sheriff's Office to monitor and regulate the uses, these uses of force. At today's hearing, this board will assess the appropriateness of the actions of all involved members based upon the facts and circumstances known to each member at the time of his or her decision to use force. All right, we don't have any witnesses today, so we, I will not be invoking the rule of exclusion. Okay. Uh, Officer DeConte, you can have a seat over there. All right, we're gonna begin with uh, Detective Radigan. Detective Radigan, can you introduce yourself and then begin? Uh, Detective Margaret Radigan, assigned to the Homicide Cold Case Unit. All right. Thank you, ma'am. You may begin. So the officer involved incident, the CCR number is 18-753031. It occurred on Wednesday, 1031 of 2018 at 2350 hours. It's occurred at Hilltop Apartments, located at 1646 West 45th Street, Building J. Officer involved is R. DeConte, ID number 63452. At the time, he was assigned to Citywide Community Problem Response Team. His date of employment is August 2008. He was issued a body-worn camera on 10-19-19 after the incident. So the summary of the case, on Wednesday, 10-31-2018, at approximately 22-53 hours, a 66-year-old black male called 911 to report that he had been robbed at gunpoint by four black males. The robbery occurred while Mr. Bain was at the Star, car, star Wash Car Wash at 7082 Lem Turner Road. During the robbery, the suspects beat him so severely it caused him to lose consciousness. The suspects robbed Mr. Bain of his cell phone, money, wallet, and they fled in Mr. Bain's white 2017 Chevrolet Silverado crew cab truck. Officers were dispatched to Mr. Bailey's current location, BP gas station, located at 7211 Lem Turner Road. Mr. Bailey was unable to give a detailed description of the suspects, but officers were able to obtain Mr. Bailey's vehicle information. A bolo, be on the lookout, was broadcasted via radio to the Zone 5 officers. 
At 2343 hours, officers re received information from Mr. Williams on Star Service that his truck was last seen traveling north on Avenue B from West 33rd Street. Further updates from OnStar on the truck's direction of travel were continually broadcasted over the Zone 5 radio by officers. Officer R. DeConti, who was working Zone 5 with his squad, is assigned squad, Citywide Community Problem Response Unit, heard the bolo for the armed robbery and carjacking. Based on the directions the truck was traveling, Officer DeConti decided to head to the area of Hilltop Apartments, 1646 West 45th Street, in an attempt to locate and intercept the suspects. As Officer DeConti was traveling east on West 45th Street from Moncrief Road toward Hilltop Apartments, Officer DeConti observed the white Chevrolet truck traveling west on West 45th Street. Officer DeConti activated his patrol vehicle emergency lights. The white truck then made a left turn into Hilltop Apartments. Officer DeConti pursued the truck into the complex while advising the other officers via radio of the truck's location. Officer DeConti pursued the truck to the back of the apartment complex, at which time he observed at least three black males exit the vehicle and flee on foot. Officer DeConti pursued the driver of the truck east through the complex. Officer DeConti gave verbal commands to the suspect to stop running, but the suspect refused to comply and continued to flee. The suspect ran to the stairway of Building J and began to climb the three flights of stairs to the top level. Officer DeConti continued to give verbal commands to the suspect, but the suspect still would not comply. Fearing the suspect was armed, Officer DeConti began to tactically approach the suspect up to the third floor. Officer DeConti observed the suspect on the third floor landing with his back to Officer DeConti and his hands concealed. Officer DeConti continued to give loud verbal commands telling the suspect to show his hands and get on the ground. The suspect made several overt actions that caused Officer DeConti to fear for his life. Officer DeConti discharged his issued firearm one time striking the suspect. The suspect was transported to UF Health Hospital, where he was pronounced deceased. He was later identified as Tony Bernard Smith, Jr. So the timeline of events, at 10-31-2018, at 22-49 hours, he calls 911 to report that he has been robbed by several black males, one with a handgun. During the robbery, the suspects kicked and punched Mr. B and then fled in his 2017 Chevy Silverado truck. So this will go on. I'll cut it off because I'll transfer it over to JFRD, but it gives some of the description and also that the suspects were armed. Jackson, Sheriff's Office, found them. Yes, sir. I have a customer that has a complaint. I'll let him talk to you. So, okay. you need to I'll let you talk to him. Hello. Hi, this is Jackson, Sheriff's Office. I've been uh, robbed. They uh, beat me up, stole my truck. What's the address? Yeah, what is the address that you're at? Big party. What is the address that you're at? I'm on, uh, what's this address? 7211 Nip Turn Road. 7211 Nip Turn Road. I was at the car wash the street. Uh, okay, are you at the BP now? Yes. Uh, okay, do you have any idea of the individuals that took the beat you up and took the vehicle? I don't have the slightest idea. You need an ambulance to come check on you? Uh, I don't, I, I don't know. Okay. How many individuals was that? I, I, I couldn't tell three to, to, the, to four. I, I, I couldn't. Did you tell if they were black, white, or Hispanic? They were black. Male or female? I think they were still, still male. Oh, okay. What kind of vehicle do you have? 19, uh... I mean, 2017 White Silverado Crew Cab. Did you see which direction they took off at it? They knocked me out. I, I, couldn't, I can't tell you anything. Uh, okay, when did you know about when this all occurred? It just, I just woke up. It just, just happened. Well, how long did it take? How long has it just happened? Five minutes? Ten minutes? Uh, they knocked me out. I, I, I guess about two minutes. I, I can tell you. Okay. What's your last name, sir? Bleeding all over the place. You want an ambulance to come check on you? Just to make sure? All right, yeah. Uh, something. I, 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 yeah. Okay. Are you going to be waiting inside the business or are you going to be outside? Uh, 
I can, uh, I can wear that back. Okay, what color shirt and pants are you wearing so the officers and everyone know who to look for? What, what? What color shirt and pants are you wearing? Uh, my shirt all tore up. It's, it's, it's white. I'm wearing jeans. Are you black, black. white, or Hispanic? Huh? Are you black, white, or Hispanic? Black. As far as you're aware, is anyone drinking, doing drugs as a weapon or anything? I couldn't tell you. Uh, I was over there cleaning some screens and stuff, and he just walked up behind me. I turned around, he had a gun, and I tried to run. They grabbed me and beat me and kicked me, and I was yelling and then. Okay, the, the one that had the gun, can you tell what color shirt and pants he had on, or do you remember? I, I can't, I can't. The light went out over there, it was dark. Okay. Sir? Sir, stand up on me, I'll get us connected to a rescue real quick, so we can get your name going. So at that time, he gets transferred over to JFRD. At 22, 54, 35 hours, officers are dispatched to a robbery to an individual with injuries. They are sent to the BP gas station at 7211 Lem Turner Road. The dispatcher further states that the victim was assaulted by approximately four black males, one armed with a gun. The individual stole <coughs> the victim's 2017 white Silverado truck with crew cab. So, effective November 16, on 23rd, an individual with a D3 7211 Lem Turner Road, 7211 Lem Turner Road at the BP gas station. Complaint advised that was, he was aviated by approximately four brother mice, one with single zero with a gun. Advised the single in his 2017 white Chevy Silverado with a crew cab. At 22:59:16 hours, CPR unit 1607 officer E. M. Megala advises he is he has arrived at the scene, 7211 Lem Turner Road. Hey, 2302, Officer Megala issues a bolo for the white 2017 Silverado crew cab, unknown tag, occupied by three to four black males. Twenty-three sixteen forty-four. Officer Megala updates the bolo to add the vehicle tag, which is Charlie Whiskey Uniform, Uniform Nine One, with an expiration of twelve thirty-one eighteen. The vehicle tag is going to be Charlie Whiskey Uniform, Uniform Nine One, expiration date of twelve thirty-one two thousand eighteen. Does come back to a two thousand seventeen white Chevrolet truck. At 23.43 hours, Officer Megala advises dispatch that he had received information from OnStar about live information from the robbery vehicle that it is last known to be headed north on Avenue B from West 33rd Street. So, Put together a map, the next few uh, transmissions are going to be the actual locations that the officer is um, giving out over the Zone 5 radio. Nobody is behind the vehicle at that time, but he's giving the locations where the vehicle is traveling. Officers are starting to get in the area looking for the vehicle. So he was last, the last transmission was Avenue B in West 33rd. The next transmission. Yeah, 15, so westbound on West 43rd right now, Jeff. And we believe from West 43rd up to Avenue C comes out onto 45th. 45th and Spellman, K915. Going northbound on Spellman. On oh, Spellman approaching Brooklyn. I believe goes uh, eastbound on Brooklyn. Eastbound on Brooklyn approaching Xavier. Northbound Xavier. I believe he comes down to Meharry. Southbound Benedict. Which is on Benedict here. Eastbound on Rutledge. Southbound on Costa de Liano. I guess that's the way he said. So we'll go southbound on here and then back kind of southwest over here to Hill Hilltop Apartments. Going to South Hilltop. So that's the last from the OnStar location. At 23.48.47, Officer DeConte states four Bravo mics over the radio. 
234901, Officer DeConte advises they are running in the middle. We're running in the middle. We're running in the middle. 234957, Officer DeConte states, shots fired. Show me your hands. Shots fired. Shots fired. Show me your hands. 235055, Officer DeConte requests rescue to respond up top. Twenty-three fifty-two oh three, Officer Megala, sixteen oh seven, request rescue. Reference a person shot. Okay, two sixteen oh seven, your rescue ten sixteen in the back patio. Officer one shot. Twenty-three fifty-two thirteen, Officer Megala advises that the suspect was shot, not the officer. Not an officer, it's gonna be a suspect. This is a um, photograph of 7182 Lem Turner Road. This is the car wash where the robbery carjacking occurred. occurred in this bay here. And as you can, as I explained earlier in the summary, what Mr. Uh, Quint said over his 911 call was um, he tried to get away from him. At that point, they began uh, beating him and kicking him severely. This is him at the hospital with some injuries. Facial injuries, he's got an injury to his ear. You can see some bruising to his shoulder. And this is taken of Mr. Um, a couple days after. You can see the extensive bruising. He had stitches in his ear, abrasions to his knees. So just kind of mapping where the car wash was to the Hilltop Apartments. Obviously, you have almost a 50-minute uh, time lapse from, you know, vehicle from the robbery to where Hilltop, um, uh, the West 33rd and Avenue uh, B, coming up and through this area here and then landing over at Hilltop Apartments. And I have a surveillance video that we got at the entrance of Hilltop. There was nothing in the... Um, complex that, ca that uh, captured any part of the shooting, um, but this does show the truck coming in uh, headed westbound, and then you'll see Officer DeConte's car. Start to see. You'll see two officers go by and then the white truck. <coughs> this is your white truck. And you'll start to see the lights from Officer DeConte's vehicle. Pulling into Hilltop. And the other officer's right behind. This aerial view of Hilltop Apartments. This was taken the following day. See West 45th Street. This is the entrance of Hilltop Apartments. The truck was coming in this direction, turned in, drives down the, this side of the complex. This is the truck as they bailed, and then Officer uh, Conti's vehicle. Uh, go across the courtyard, and this is where the shooting occurs in Building J. Just another view, the entrance officers and suspects vehicle and building J. Pictures at the night of the incident, Officer DeConte's vehicle, the truck with the doors open after suspects bail. This is a building J where the suspect fled up the stairs this is taken with the extended um, shutter photography, so it's a lot brighter than it actually was. Um, they come in through here, go up to, end up going up the third level. 
Um, it's still a little bit brighter, but you can see it's a lot darker, um, very low light, especially when you get up onto the third level. This is coming up onto the second level. This is the only light that's illuminating. The third level will be up in here will be completely dark. Again, this is taken with the extended shutter photography where it's showing actually a lot brighter. And we tried to do it a little bit where it was more accurate. And I had the incident. This is the evidence that's at the scene. And the blood so identifies some 90 degree blood spots here, drops there. Uh, medical attention was given around in this area here. This is showing an aerial view of diagram from the uh, evidence technicians. Um, I went a little bit clearer and um, located some, uh, identified some evidence that was uh, from the aerial photographs. Number one here, this is going to end up being a cell phone. And then our number two evidence is found over here. Again, one being a cell phone here, and number two was a handgun. Closer up on the handgun. And just showing you an overall where the vehicles were, um, the evidence that was located in Building J. This is a diagram of the stairwell number three. It's going to be a black mask. And showing the same photograph again where they're coming up on the stairwell, the ski skull cap was found over here. So either he could have thrown it as he was coming up or threw it from the upper level. And then another diagram of the third floor, number four being a cell phone, evidence marker nine, uh, five, a nine millimeter shell casing, six, seven, eight, and nine being fragments. Again, showing it up close. There's your shell casing, fragment, fragment, fragment. And then again, I'm just showing you some impact uh, blood spatter in here. You have as high as up on this wall here. We measured it. There's some impact spatter in here, so you're looking between anywhere between 36 and 40 inches from the uh, ground. A little bit closer. Everything is going downward. You'll see some smears and then his handprints down there. Suspect is going to be Tony Bernard Smith, Jr., date of birth 321 and 94. He's 24 years of age at the time. Uh, criminal history has three felony arrests, zero felony convictions. Um, arrest for carrying concealed firearm, um, 8-12 of 2018, armed possession and ag assault with a deadly weapon. Um, he had an outstanding warrant for one count of burglary and two counts of written threats to kill or do bodily harm. And that issue, that warrant was issued on 10-24-2018. Um, autopsy results, um, Tony Smith, autopsy was conducted under ME number 18-2330 by Dr. Buxbaum. Toxicology only showed caffeine, uh, no blood alcohol, and cause of death was a single gunshot wound to the torso, and the manner of death was homicide. Um, these were taken at the hospital when the, uh, Tony Smith was taken to UF Health. Uh, he had in possession uh, Clinton Bailey's driver's license and credit cards. This is the skull cap um, that was found at the scene. His cell phone download had a picture of him wearing a similar for that skull cap. Um, that skull cap was sent off to FDOE. Uh, his DNA was found um, on the skull cap, and his DNA was found on the left front grill of the Mr. Bailey's truck. Uh, Co-defendants um, charged with, car um, with carjacking with a firearm, a deadly weapon, 11-1 of 2018. It's going to be Jamal Bernard Lincoln, uh, 21 years of age, JSO number 736715, uh, where we had the cell phone and the firearm. That's where Mr. Uh, Lincoln was taken into custody over in that area. Uh, admitted to being in the truck but been denied being involved in the carjacking. Was in possession of Clinton Bailey's phone when he was apprehended. Uh, 
another co-defendant was interviewed the uh, night. It's going to be Jazz Purnell Shields, 28 years of age, JSO number 706612. Um, he said he was interviewed the night of the shooting, denied knowing any of the co-defendants and being in the vehicle or having any involvement in the carjacking. Uh, the following day, his fingerprints were found on the white Chevrolet Silverado. Uh, he was arrested on a warrant for 120, on 125 2019 for carjacking with a firearm or deadly weapon. And then his DNA also came back inside the vehicle. The firearm recovered at the scene is going to be a Ruger model number LC9. The serial number is November Romeo Alpha 109197. There was one round in the chamber eight live rounds in the magazine. FDLE, FDLE lab results demonstrated a mixture of DNA from the gun. The DNA data is not interpretable, interpretable due to the limited mixture obtained. The ATF trace on the Ruger LC9, serial number NRA109197. Firearm was purchased um, by Louis Harry Donnarumma in Fort White, Florida on 2-17-2015. Uh, from Joe's Guns in Lake City. Attempted to uh, locate Mr. Donnarumma. I was unable to, and I was unable to get any information from the Joe's um, Guns in Lake City. Officer DeConte's weapon inventory. His firearm is a Glock, model 17, serial number. <laughs> one round in the chamber, 16 rounds in the magazine, one shot fired. And then this is the state attorney's uh, disposition letter that was dated August 20th, 2020. And the letter states, it's this letter is to advise you that the review of the death investigation of Tony Smith is now complete. After a f full review by our officer involved incident team, we have concluded that the death of Tony Smith was justified under applicable Florida law. We will be providing a detailed report our, of our review to you in the near future. Thank you, Detective Radigan. Um, can you briefly explain when a police involved shooting happens and the cold case unit responds, what is done during a canvas and what it is? Um, yeah, so we'll, obviously we're going out and working the scene, but we're also going to go and do a canvas, especially a Building J, to see if anybody witnessed anything, heard anything. Yes, ma'am. Um, do, do you all look for additional video? Yes, always. Other than the video shown, were you able to locate any video that shows the shooting? No. Were you able to locate any witnesses that observed the shooting? Uh, did not directly observe the shooting. Okay. I, uh, I have no further questions. Detective Radigan, was there a, um, a witness that gave some conflicting statements that don't match the evidence? Yes. There was a, actually on in 254, she had called uh, 911, um, but Detective Chapman went out and spoke with her. Um, and as when he spoke with her, she was inside during the entire shooting. She couldn't have seen what happened. Can so you, she, oh, thank you. Can you explain a little bit more about what that blood evidence shows us about the posture of the suspect? Definitely, I'll go, go down to it. Definitely not laying on the ground. Um, he is 5'11", so, sorry. Five eleven uh, is his height. So he's about halfway, so he's probably going to be in a more crouching position in between standing and crouching, definitely not laying on the ground. Um, as I explained, you'll see the blood is dripping downward. So as he's going down, then you get your 90 degrees. Looks like his palm of his hand is he's probably getting on the ground at that time. And again, if he was laying in this area here, you would not, this would all be void of any blood. Okay. And then how about any bullet strikes? I did not locate any bullet strikes, just the fragments. I know the, um, so that's the cell phone that was downloaded and had a picture of the suspect in the mask? Yes. How about the cell phone that was on the path next to McFarland? There was, uh, that was the only data that I was able to get. The other two cell phones I got very minimal or no, just a phone number off of uh, that cell phone. Okay. 
And then the, um, so that second cell phone, kind of near the firearm, would that be close enough for the suspect to throw or, or not necessarily? I'm not um, exactly clear as far as if that was uh, Tony Smith's direction of travel. You know, that was Jamal. If he could have thrown it, they could have run right behind each other. I'm just right. not sure. So on it could that. have been Smith, who's our suspect, or Lincoln, who was arrested. That's correct. Okay. That's all. Thank you. No questions. Can you explain? You stated then you get your 90% when you were describing the pattern of the blood was in a downward position. What did you mean about a 90, you get a 90%? Did I say 90, I'm sorry? Yes, you said you get a 90%. You were describing how looking at the blood and- You have a more impact at the very top. So you have the impact and then you have your downward um, travel of your, of your uh, blood. I think you said 90 degree. 90 was degree. it 90 degree? Okay, okay 90 degree. So that would indicate the blood is dropping straight down. Yeah, and that was more here on the ground. Your 90 degree blood drops down in here, straight down. So if he's over by the wall, if he's in a crouching position, you get that impact from that round coming out. Um, he's going down, that blood is traveling down. Probably just smears on the wall where he's going down, his handprint bleeding down, you're getting that 90 degree drop. Okay. What experience do you have in interpreting blood? I am not a blood spider expert, but 15, 16 years of working homicides. Thank you. A little experience. I do have a question. Where did the bullet strike in his torso? It's more in the upper back area and comes out through the chest. So what does that, that bullet strike tell us again about the posture of the suspect? Um, turning towards the officer, Facing him, not facing him. And then listening or reading Officer DeConte's statements, the evidence at the scene, and there's a little bit of, of trajectory in the uh, very slight left to right um, movement of the, of the bullet. He's obviously turning, you know, happening, you know, within seconds. Is he turning this way, turning back? You know, Officer DeConte even states that he's kind of looking as a plan, maybe sizing up and, and looking. He's moving so around possibly a lot. turning towards the officer, leading with the left hand. Possibly, yeah. And do you know if the the co-defendants, their criminal cases are completed? No, sir. They're still pending. Okay. Right. Uh, through the board, um, can you again state? I mean, you briefly said at the beginning, but was Officer DeConte wearing a body camera during this incident? No, they were not issued uh, body cams at that time. Uh, they're still in the process of uh, getting most of the agency uh, issued. Thank you, Detective Radigan. Yes, sir. All right, we'll call uh, Detective DeConte, or Officer DeConte. Officer Conte. Good morning, sir. Uh, when you're ready, if you can uh, provide a statement of what happened. If you need to stand up and demonstrate anything, there's uh, props that you're able to. We do ask that if you stand up and demonstrate for the benefit of the recording that you demonstrate it in front of your table and between these two tables. Yes, sir. All right. You may begin, sir. October 31st, 2018, I, uh, roughly 2300, roughly 11 p.m., I overheard a 20, uh, carjacking over the radio, and community problem response team, we 
travel with Bravo 13 OSS channel inside the vehicle and the zone channel, Alpha 5, Zone 5, on our portable. Officer Miguel arrived on that scene, started giving updates in reference to the victim, what occurred, and what the truck looked like. Roughly 15, 20 minutes later, he began giving further updates and stating that OnStar is, is activated and BOLO for uh, the updates coming. I was near division in MLK. When I heard this, I started making my way towards 45th and Moncrief area. When I heard the first update stating Avenue B, November 1 subsector area. I was a little familiar with that area. So I started making my way in that direction from division and MLK. Few of the updates in reference to the victim was that he was hit multiple times, kicked, and also perhaps with the pistol, firearm, whatever was used at the time. He was elderly. I did not know the color of the suspect or correction of the victim, other than he was a elderly person. And that he was given the updates across the street from the location of the car wash where the incident occurred. On my way to the area of the OnStar updates, I started hearing the street names and started thinking they're probably going to 45th in Moncrief near Hilltop. That was the uh, direction of the OnStar updates. But officers were about two blocks away each time the updates came up. Just like in the uh, video, you, you observed two officers driving past the complex. It's because they were a little unfamiliar with the area. I was driving a little slower, anticipating them coming out to 45th near Hilltop. Once I heard the last update, I was pretty certain they were going to be coming in my direction, head on with me near the entrance of Hilltop Apartments. When I observed the front end of the white Chevy truck, I could clearly see the Chevy gold badge emblem on the front of the grill. I could see that it was a white truck and it was the only truck that was on the road at that moment in front of me. As soon as I activated my lights, it made immediate left turn into the complex. I made an immediate right and gave chase upon giving updates on the zone channel, Alpha 5. It jumped the curb just like in the video there slightly as it entered and accelerated approximately 60 miles an hour down the stretch. Down this stretch right here, approximately 60 miles an hour from the entrance, which is right here. Where it ended up right here. And I stopped about this distance away, anticipating all four suspects being armed. I didn't want to park too close. As I was about to put it in park, because they had stopped, immediately all four doors opened. The driver door opened almost simultaneously with the rear driver door. Along, along this side right here, I could clearly see the suspect I chased was the driver and suspect Lincoln was the one in the driver rear seat that was apprehended in this area somewhere over here. I 
couldn't tell too much of the suspects here because it was pitch black over here, but they ran. They kind of scattered this way and this way, so I wasn't sure. I was focused on the driver because he went this way. And if I wouldn't have went after him, he would have he would have escaped to this location here. As I observed the two suspects on the driver's side exit, I could see suspect Smith holding his waist pocket, front area, and the immediate exiting the vehicle, he sprinted. So I had to sprint after him, but I was never able to get close enough. I was probably 15 to 20 yards behind him throughout the chase. <clears throat> So he had entered here. By the time I, thank you, detective. By the time I got to here, I slowed down for a second, drew my gun, anticipating he was armed. I could hear him sprinting up the steps, his feet. And I could also hear him pause in between, almost as if he was trying to enter a doorway or figure out what he was going to do. He continued up to the third floor. I began approaching to the second floor methodically and slowly. I wasn't in a rush because either he was going to be in the apartment or he was going to jump off. There was nowhere he could go to at this point. However, I was afraid he was going to enter an apartment, and I didn't want that to happen. This was Halloween night. There weren't kids that I could tell at the moment, but it was still Halloween night, and it wasn't that late. When I approached the second floor, I could hear his footsteps kind of stop. Once I got to This location here I was leaning because I was using the, the concrete as my cover with my gun drawn I could see him slightly and I was giving verbal commands throughout this whole chase throughout the steps throughout me seeing him until I was seeing him to stop show me your hands get on the ground As he stopped and realized he was kind of cornered slightly, I probably approached the midway of the stairwell level to get a good, better look of, of his body, waistline, his demeanor. I still couldn't see the top, the top floor at the time. So I wanted to gain a few more steps, but I wanted some compliance before advancing closer to him. As he began to realize that he wasn't going anywhere, he started to give on his fours as I started approaching. I was trying to get a better look on this side to make sure there wasn't any, any anything Anything over here or over here, waiting for ambush or, or what have you, or if he threw something down. Can I demonstrate how he began to? Yes, sir.
Yes, sir. All right, and then just for the benefit of the public, this is Detective Shao. She is a response to resistance. Immediately after I shot, I assessed the situation. He had turned at that point facing me, and I think he was sitting at that point. I was going to shoot again, realized he wasn't concealing his hands any longer, and he wasn't moving towards his waistband. Detective Redding, can you go to the uh, beginning where it shows Officer DeConti a picture of him in uniform? While she's going that, can you just give us a um, how long you've been with the department and what units you've been assigned to? I've been on the department for 13 years. For the first two, I was in Zone 5. For the next four, I was on Operation Safe Streets. For the next one and a half, I was in Zone 5 Task Force. And for the remainder, until 13 years, I was with the Community Problem Response Team. Okay, do you have any military experience? No, sir. Okay. Um, for the record, this is the uniform you're wearing for the night? Yes, sir. Okay, and are you wearing a uh, body or body armor in this picture? Yes, sir. Okay, it's under your shirt? Yes, sir. Okay. And during your, your pres or, um, when you were saying that you were listening to two radios, can you, can you kind of briefly describe what that is? The OSS channel is a talk channel that we use inside the vehicle, updating, speaking car to car amongst our, our squads. The red and blue, this was a fat day, so red and blue were working the Halloween night. So okay. there was about 14 officers working. So for the public, that's the car to car radio, so you can speak to the officers on your squad, and then you're also listening to the actual zone radio, and that's the, that's the channel which calls are being dispatched to, to the entire zone. Yes, sir, so we don't interfere with the, the zone channel radio traffic. Okay. And um, at the date of this incident, I know Detective Bragg spoke on it, but you had not been issued a body-worn camera at that time? No, sir. No one on on the community problem response team was issued one at that time. And when this call was dispatched through your training experience, you recognized that carjacking to be a 
forcible felony by Florida statutes? Yes, sir. Okay. In, in your time, you had become familiar with Hilltop Apartments? Yes, there's been multiple incidents there since I've started back in 08 that I can recall. And then you kind of alluded to it, but you knew how the apartments are laid out with the complexes, how you can enter in, and you briefly stated, too, that you knew there was, when he entered, there was no way out. He was had to go up. Yes, sir. And did, um, when you were describing what happened, it, I'm assuming it did not happen that slowly. It happened much faster. No, sir. It was, by the time they exited the vehicle and the shooting was probably one minute, roughly. And then as he's turning towards you and he takes his hand away and you're no longer going to see it, is that a point that you were in fear for your life and the safety of others? Yes, sir. I was in fear he was going to reach for a gun that was possibly used in the crime or another gun. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions. All right. Um, Officer DeConte, oftentimes stolen vehicles are um, used for joy rides and then traded for drugs. Um, have you ever experienced that in the past? Yes, sir, I have. Can you tell us why you do not believe that to be the case tonight? Because this incident from the time it was reported to the time I observed the vehicle was, was less than an hour. I believe this was the vehicle and it was not a regular auto theft. It was a carjacking vehicle. And you believe the suspects that bailed out at the termination point to be the same suspects from the robbery and not people that the vehicle has since been traded to? Yes, sir. When the, the updates came that it was three to four black males, I, I observed minimum three black males in that truck. Have you ever chased a suspect on foot who is uh, just running, trying to hold their pants up? Yes, sir. So how would you explain the difference um, in your thoughts? In other words, why did you think the suspect was holding a gun in his waistband as opposed to just holding his pants up? At, at the time, I assumed all four, all four of the suspects were armed. I, I didn't know which one. The, the victim couldn't tell which one used the firearm at the time. So through my training, I'm going to assume all four are armed. Was there any difference in the, um, the, the type of run um, that made you think he was holding on to a pistol? He didn't seem like he was holding up his, his waist like his pants were falling down. It seemed as if, as if he was holding some type of substance or in the, in the, some weight in his pocket. Okay. So as opposed to just hanging on to his belt so his pants don't fall down. It looked like he was holding on to something heavy. Yes, sir. And you've, have you been in enough foot chases um, to recognize the difference? Yes, sir, I have. So if you thought the suspect was armed, and you knew that he had been involved in a violent felony, why chase him by yourself into a possible ambush? Why not slow down, wait for K-9, air unit, set a perimeter? As I said earlier, I, I believe he was going to enter possibly a home invasion in one of those apartments because a lot of times the suspects flee from us in that apartment complex and enter any random unlocked door. They've done it numerous times, and I was afraid he was going to do that that night. And this was Halloween, which involved trick-or-treating throughout different neighborhoods? Yes, sir. And then lastly, the suspects got on the ground like you told them to. And then some people would say, well, he was trying to show you his left hand and you shot him. So how would you counter that, that narrative? I said multiple times to lay flat, extend your arms, show me your hands, 
Stop moving around. Stop moving around. He continued to move around as if he was concealing something or had something to prevent him from doing that. So I was in fear he was going to do something. So he was not laying completely flat? No, sir. Typically, how do people lay when they're um, going to comply with your attempts to handcuff them? They would get on the ground and place their hands on their back if they can. And I would wait for backup at that time, which they were coming. And I would have put, one of us would have put them in, in handcuffs. So typically they lie completely flat. Yes, sir. Not as demonstrated by the role-playing officer tonight or this afternoon? Correct. Normally they lay flat, don't move. And then one of the officers that's assisting will assist putting on handcuffs. That's all for now. So on that particular stairwell and you were on the stairs uh, and you had him in your um, sight, right? your gun was drawn, were you utilizing your pistol light? Yes, sir. Okay. And it illuminated it enough so that you could see one hand, but you couldn't see the other? Yes, sir. Is there a reason that you can articulate as to why you pressed up the steps and not waited for your backup, considering they were less than a minute behind you? Because I still couldn't see the left, the left side of his, where his left arm was. And based on that information, his actions with his left hand, is there anything you've ever observed, seen, uh, which would indicate that you could have been shot from that angle or that position? I've been trained at the academy through Sergeant Joel Weeks during a field force training session. I could lay on the ground sideways and shoot accurately from 15 to 20 yards from the ground. And so it was, the information that you received was that it was a uh, armed carjacking suspect, multiple, and it was, uh, they were violent with regards to the actions they took um, to the victim, is that correct? Yes, sir, and, and an elderly victim was another reason I thought they were a little bit more dangerous than, than the usual. Is there a specific reason you chased the driver as opposed to any of the other passengers? I've been trained to get the driver. It's the main one we want to get. They're in possession of the vehicle. No further questions. Chief Smith, do you mind if we stay on this topic just for a second? Sure. Um, in your experience, is that apartment complex largely occupied or unoccupied? Large, largely occupied. Okay. Were there um, that stairwell where the suspect was taken into custody, were there apartments up there? Yes, sir. Would you have any way of knowing if they were occupied at that, at that exact moment? No, sir. What were your concerns about anyone else in the area? Are you familiar with the priority, the safety priorities? Yes, sir. Can you tell us about that in your own words? The entire body, hands, waistline, demeanor, and the immediate area, which the immediate area there, I was concerned, the hands, the left one, and the waistline I was concerned with. Okay, so that's gonna be the discrimination process. Let's talk a little bit about the um, safety priorities. Um, are you familiar with that or do you? Yes, sir. I was, the number one concern is citizens in Jacksonville. Second is first responders. Thirdly is suspects. Okay, coming after the officer? Yes, sir. So, was there, um, were there any sirens in the distance coming, officers responding? I believe the cavalry was coming at that point. But you're not, you don't necessarily remember sirens. Um, were you giving loud verbal commands? Loud and numerous verbal com commands. Was there any chance that a, um, Innocent citizen come out of, could have come out of one of those apartments to see what all the noise was? Yes, sir. 
there was one that came out afterwards. Okay, and then that citizen would have been um, exposed to the suspect that you were trying to take into custody? Yes, sir, he would have been. It was on the second floor. Thank you, Chief Smith. Can we go back to the photo that captures the scene where the suspect was shot? Specifically the one that captures the blood on the wall. Go back. Yes, yes. Do you have any idea how that blood got on the wall? No, ma'am. Thank you. That's all I have. I have no questions. Other questions? All right. Uh, we'll uh, hear from the Academy Range Master. Uh, we'll go into executive session. During executive session, we'll discuss amongst board members. And uh, no more questions for the officers. At the end of the executive session, we'll vote on three questions. The first question will be, was the members use of force within Department of Policy. The second question will be, does the member need any additional situational training? And the third and final question will be, should this case be referred to internal affairs for any further investigation? Uh, as we enter executive session, uh, OGC, do you have any additional input? I do not, thank you. Okay. From the academy training aspect? Uh, from Officer DeConnie's testimony, I see no training issues. Obviously, he takes everything into account in an attempt to apprehend these dangerous felony suspects. He spoke about parking at a distance and tactfully, so obviously knowing these individuals were armed. He was aware during the foot chase, the officer testified he slowed down during, once they reached the stairwell, um, in an attempt to avoid an ambush from this suspect. And he allowed numerous verbal commands for this officer or this suspect to comply. Um, obviously, he clearly articulated his fear and immediate danger the suspect was posing to him. So based on his testimony, I see no training issues. All right. Okay. Yes, sir. Any concerns of mine have been addressed by the board. Okay. Further the discussion from the board? Sure. The um, suspects we know were involved in a violent, dangerous felony. We know at least one of the suspects is armed. We know that vehicle was not traded for drugs, that the suspects in the vehicle were the same ones that committed those crimes. Um, we believe that at least one of those suspects discarded a firearm along the, the route of the foot pursuit. Uh, I feel like Officer DeConte had an obligation to chase after the suspect in order to keep the citizens inside of that apartment complex safe. I think we're all aware of instances where suspects will break into a home in order to hide from the police during a foot chase. I think Officer DeConte was obligated to um, try to prevent that from happening. And lastly, I think the, um, the demeanor of the suspect and his hesitancy to comply with the verbal commands um, shows that the suspect was still in his decision-making process trying to decide his no next course of action. Um, and for all those reasons, I can understand how Officer DeConte ended up in that situation. Senator Lisa? No, no, nothing further. I agree with Chief Short reference how Officer DeConte ended up in the situation. I also understand the decision to go after the suspect. I'm just left with trying to determine how the blood got on the wall based on the demonstration of the suspect's position. That is something that's lingering for me. So I don't know the answer to that. Um, but I think we have to remember how many hours later that photograph was taken. Um, was that part of JFRD's medical treatment? Mm -hmm. Was that part of multiple officers showing up and handcuffing the suspect, moving him around? Um, we, we just don't know enough to, to say. Uh, if we had it on video, it would make much more sense to us. But um, you know, who knows how that blood got moved around as the suspect was treated 
for his injuries and, and, and taken into custody. Through the chair, could we uh, go to Detective Radigan about this? Uh, no, we, we're done with the uh, discussion with this discussion just for the board. Okay. How about a, a former but, homicide sergeant? Do you have any insight? I believe due to the time frame, but after the individual was shot, if he is, when they're rendering aid, you know, his, his, when they're turning him over, he could touch the wall. Any, anything could have happened without specific apps asking Officer DeConte those questions. So to include that be from a, an officer or a first yeah. responder? who's gotten blood on himself and is trying to get it off of himself. Yeah, I'm, I, my question on that is not, you know, that, that's not lingering in my mind because there are so many different ways that that could get there. It would be lingering on my mind if we saw the blood in a bullet strike uh, in the same area, which would not, and that to me would lead mm -hmm. me to believe that uh, the description that was given is not the same as the physical evidence, but. In this case, with, with the, uh, the blood evidence, it's not inconsistent with the description given all the activity that happened after the shoot. Uh, as, as far as uh, the, your summary of events, I, I agree with you. Uh, in this situation, uh, the officers were dealing with very dangerous armed suspects who beat an elderly person and stole their vehicle in a carjacking. Uh, Halloween night, uh, many of the doors in the apartment complex, even though it was later, a good possibility that some of those doors remain open. We have armed suspects, multiple potential armed suspects running through an apartment complex with multiple, multiple officers in foot pursuit uh, to end up on a landing where you basically have an individual that is now trapped. Uh, those split second decisions get further intensified uh, when that individual knows it's basically uh, a no escape situation for them, which obviously would heighten the situation for the officer involved as far as safety and, and safety of the citizens in addition to themselves. Um, I didn't see any violations in the tactics that were used or in the uh, policies, all the policies that uh, were in place. No, I didn't see any violations of those either. I believe, too, the suspect had every opportunity to peacefully surrender during the traffic stop. He chose to continue driving. He chose to flee. Chose to flee up those stairs. Any further discussion? No. All right, we'll go to the vote. First question is Was the member's use of force within departmental policy? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Yes. Yes. And I'm also yes. Second question Does the member need any additional situational training? No, he does not. No, he does not. No. No. I'm also no. The third question is, should this case be referred to Internal Affairs for any further investigation? No, it should not. No, it should not. No. No. And I'm also a no. So the uh, vote will be summarized in a report to the sheriff. Ultimately, it's the sheriff's decision on what additional actions, if any, to take on this case. Um, and uh, but you'll be notified of, of that decision. 946, uh, we are adjourned.